Hello and welcome to the Mobile Game Dev Playbook. Thanks for tuning in for another episode. This is a podcast all about what makes a great mobile game, what is and isn't working for mobile game designers, and all of the latest trends. I'm your host, John Jordan, and uh, we are going to be talking about trends. This is a big, a big trends episode. This is looking back at 2022, and we have our, our experts. We have uh, Kale Helkanen and uh, Erno Kieski, both uh, Chief Game Analysts at Game Refinery by Liftoff. How's it going, guys? Quite great. Great to be again here. Probably the last episode for me, at least, in, for, the, for the year. Interesting to look back what's what's happened and so on. So nice to be. Before we get there, we have an important milestone. We have a, a little a little celebration. I think we can be so bold. So so the uh, the podcast series now has done uh, over 25,000 downloads. So that's uh, congratulations to us and uh, congratulations to all the people who've been downloading and watching and, and doing things with podcasts and video cards. So thanks to everyone for that. That's, it's good to know that uh, we're not just talking into the ether, <laughs> that people are actually uh, getting getting useful data out of that. So uh, let's, uh, but let's move on now. So yes, end of the year, um, in, in every respect, it's been a, a pretty eventful year. Uh, we're going to focus on mobile games and um, as our sort of overall sort of broad theme obviously we'll look at various things we're sort of thinking sort of main thing sort of shaping um, quite a lot of what's going on is, is about sort of scaling games so basically taking games and making them uh, more popular more 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 profitable um and uh, erna you're going to lead us with that as a sort of um how that has shaped really the the mobile game um sort of trends in 2022 yeah definitely so well of course like if we talk about the whole game industry and especially mobile game industry naturally the biggest topic on everyone's, you know, mouths and in, 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 in everyone's thoughts uh, has been naturally the big changes in the whole whole market in terms of scaling the game. So in terms of the UA, uh, the Apple changes, uh, ATT, uh, uh, and and so on, and that's definitely can be seen in the market and in the games that have been able to scale, have been able to find audiences, and if we need to, you know, pinpoint any, you know, bigger bigger thing from the market in the past year that's probably gonna be the one uh, of course there's the uh or everything else that is going on in the world the macroeconomic stuff and so on but like if we talk about specifically our our industry the mobile games that has to be the the main topic to start with so then like how it actually has affected the market and in terms of especially uh, the new games where the, you know, the, of course, UA is uh, important for the whole life cycle of game, but especially if you bring out the new game, how you are able to find the audience. So more crucial than ever. And if we look at the data, uh, for example, for the iOS uh, US uh, market now, what we can see over there is that uh, if we look at games that have been launched in the past 365 days, so in the past basically one year, there are actually only eight games uh, that are currently in the top crossing 200. So basically only handful of games that are less than a year old have been able to scale uh, among the top 200 crossing uh, games. So quite a, quite a, quite a big uh, difference. For example, just if we compare to kind of like the uh, games that have been released in the past two years, but are older than one year, there are actually over 20 of those games. Uh, and this is not counting the games that, uh, you know, has been released uh, kind of like the past 365 days. So between the 365 days and 730 days, there's over 20 of those games. And if we, you know, look at that, there's a big, big kind of like an empty space in the newer games in the top crossing 200 uh, currently in the, in, the, in the market. And naturally, one, one probably the biggest thing uh, over here, is uh, the difficulties of scaling, difficulties of UA, difficulties of targeting, finding the new audiences, scaling, scaling the new games. Uh, but of course, like Mike mentioned, you know, COVID going away uh, in, in to some extent, and you know, people doing a lot of uh, other things, and like mentioned, macroeconomic stuff and so on. There are other things, but if we think about the kind of like uh, uh, this, especially the the ATT. Uh, driven factors and if we look at what kind of games actually have been scaling uh, over there in the past one year one kind of like the biggest commonality it's not all the games but like I said there are eight games past one year and actually five of those games have some kind of an IP slapped on top 
So we have, you know, of course, like Diablo Immortal, Marvel Snap, we have Apex Legends, the Office Idler game, uh, MLB, the basketball game, uh, and, and so on and so on. So big majority of the games have utilized the strength of an IP to kind of like a scale and find organic uh, users and organic downloads in this changed uh, landscape. And if we actually quite interesting factor that I want to highlight also, if we look at, uh, for example, this slide as well, it's a game that basically is a brand new IP from Lilith, a turn-based RPG. But if we go a little bit deeper and look at what kind of a game it is, it actually uses these mythological cards like Loki and, you know, Odin and stuff like that. It's not a specifically an IP, but it can be, you know, thought as a kind of like a soft IP, so to speak, that, you know, uh, they are using well-known things, but then, you know, reimagining that. So if we count that in, it's like actually six of the eight games actually have some kind of a, you know, already existing connection for the, for the users and the players uh, in the market. So overall, I would say that is a kind of like a big commonality, the toughness of scaling uh, games to the very, very top nowadays and the strength of a kind of like a organic or like the uh, impact of an IP is bigger than ever, I would, I would say, uh, that we can see already in the, in, the, in the market data. I personally think it's very interesting to make a comparison of that, actually the Chinese market, because if we look at the data there and see uh, how many new games have there been released uh, to the Chinese market that have been able to sustain in the top 200, it's actually a pretty different story. Uh, there's 44 new games uh, in the top 200 there. Uh, and obviously, various, of kind, various kinds of reasons behind that, uh, one of them being that after the period of very strict reg regulations of, of releasing new um, abstract ideas to the, to the market, now the sort of floodgates have opened a little bit. There's a lot of, lot, of new, uh, a lot of new titles coming to the market. And also, the Western games there um, that used to, be, used to use the same app IDs that they use in the West, they have now been forced to use Chinese app IDs. So what that means practically is that these games have had to be sort of like relaunched uh, in the market. So they show up as, as sort of like new games, but, but if that, that's, been, that's been really interesting. And then another one relating to more to the Western market is that while it has been very hard uh, to scale new games to the market, um, there's one corner in the market that I would like to highlight as being very active in the sense that there's a lot of things going on, and that is definitely the merch space uh, in, 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 in the West. So if we look at, for example, the tep, uh, top 10 uh, merch games uh, in the West, we can see that the, the first two uh, are uh, merch dragons and, and merch mansion uh, that have been around in, in, for a while already. But after those, the, uh, the next eight games are actually new games released during the last uh, year. And one very specific trend that we're seeing in the merch market is the rise of these very much narrative-focused merch 2 games, such as Gossip Harbor. And then uh, Love and Pies uh, has also been doing recently uh, very, very, uh, very well. So that's been a kind of a new shift in the, in the merch games in terms of what kind of merch games have been able to uh, find uh, success. And one final note on merge is that um, it's also a mechanic that in 2022 we seen, we saw utilized more and more also in non-merge uh, games. So just to name or drop a couple of examples, Cash Tornado Slots, that's a slots game that actually has a very, pretty interesting merge event going on there. And then obviously, you know, well, Top Board is an older game. That's an example of a Forex strategy game that utilizes merge. And then Gardenscapes, just recently, I think last week, they launched a mini game event uh, that is all about merge just uh, last week. So, so very interesting things uh, happening in the merge space. Apple basically changed how you could sort of target users. And that was important because um, mobile uh, game developers have got very good at working out, you know, exactly the right. They wouldn't necessarily know the individual person, but they, would, they could target very accurately sort of um, a, a device. And they could sort of, you know, target advertising on people who really loved hardcore RPGs, say, or whatever. And that was really good for, for, for mid-core developers who were looking at these sort of, high, high, you know, highly monetizable games that they could find, you know, the few, I don't know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in the world who really like those games. And as soon as you lost that, that sort of, um, those sort of genres tended to do worse because they were having to sort of uh, do more 
general advertising to everyone and they couldn't really find the, these people who really, really like to play and spend in those games. So so I guess that's, that's the broad um, uh, sort, of, sort of trend that's happened there. And I guess the interesting thing is Apple, you know, Apple's led up for a long time about how these changes were going to happen and there was lots of debate about, you know, we, we all sort of had, had opinions about what would happen and then we've seen over this year, um, I guess, <laughs> what has happened and it's, and it's sort of been as bad as all the sort of pessimists um, sort of suggested it might be and I guess we've seen uh, sort of roll on effects to, to companies like Facebook, Meta, whatever they call themselves now um, you know, it's seen sort of impact there more, more generally but it is interesting that even in that sort of space what you find is the you know the landscape changes and that gives you sort of relative winners and losers even 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 within that so but yeah and in that world also it's all actually if we go a bit deeper in the individual games it's quite interesting if we talk about well the most recent one like the marvel snap there's for sure there's the ip benefit and the organic you know benefits from there but also if you go into the game design of marvel snap it's actually this really really you know uh it's first of all it's absolutely a great game i, I love the game uh and you know but if you look at, for example, the monetization model, it's quite different from like this uh, traditional CCG gotcha based monetization. But it's actually this, I would say, much more player friendly monetization where you just play the games, you progress in a kind of like a uh, kind of like an XP bar where you get XP for upgrading the cards, uh, which where the upgrades are also actually just cosmetic. But it's basically you're just unlocking cards. You're not able to buy gotchas or so on. And there's not that kind of like a similar uh spent depth possibility uh, as for the gotchas and that game has been able to gather a really 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 big hype around it and even you know in the uh kind of like a more you know traditional western hardcore like pc console players have been really really you know uh loving the game and it has gathered a lot of lot of lot of attention and it's this kind of like a little bit you know more lower revenue per download uh, type of a model that they are going for uh, and I had you know i've been able to get crazy amounts of downloads uh, with all of those things kind of like a combined but it's interesting to see like how sustainable then that model is that's that's the big question because uh, when the, you know the big in, initial hype dies down a little bit like uh, how how it's going to be able to sustain and that kind of like it takes us to another a bit similar that uh, kind of like a low revenue per download type of a game that scaled past year stumble guys really big viral hit like crazy amounts of downloads but if you look at that game now when the like the download virality speak is going down the revenues are going pretty much down on the same same scale and it, it has been declining quite a bit so if we actually look at for example from the last couple of years there was among us virality hit uh, which had the same kind of a graph exactly the same kind of graph and now nowadays it's much much more tinier game that it was like during the peak covid uh, and and so on and if we compare those two games stumble guys and among us they the graphs the performance graphs look really really similar but now they got acquired by scopely uh, a couple of months ago it's interesting to see are they able to turn around it with kind of like operating the game with a big, bit more muscle and so on. That's sort of interesting again. Yes, playing into how how the sort of the the marketing and the marketing landscape now has maybe we'll see how long it lasts, but has sort of flipped the way that games are made and and maybe a game like Marvel uh, Snap wouldn't have worked so well a year ago because it would have been competing with people who could who could target target their audiences better and make more money from them. But uh, yeah, we'll see how that one how that one plays out. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so uh, next to talk about uh, as, as a trend, I guess it's sort of game design type trend release is, is mini games. So we sort of mentioned it a little bit, Callis mentioned it a little bit, but where, where are we with, with mini games? Is, is, is this going to be the next thing? Yeah, it's an interesting trend that has been happening uh, to some extent, for, of course, uh, for a longer period of time. But I think it has been increased based on our, you know, research. It has been really increasing quite a bit. And the interesting thing there is that there are a couple, you know, different motivations to with this type of an approach and a couple of different ways that it has been, you know, utilized. So if we go start from the like the very simplest form, we have this kind of like a UA creative mini games that, you know, for example, Playrick has been doing for a long, long, long while. So basically... In terms of the actual gameplay, in terms of the retention, they, they don't really, well, I don't have exact data, but I would assume that, you know, because they are like exactly the same kind of like a misleading ads that are then implemented in the early, usually early player funnel to some point, they just pop up. They are just there to kind of like a, 
so that, so that they can say that okay we have these mini games in, in in there and then if we go a little bit further uh that's happened this year uh and found really really big success is this really really interesting case of a game called x hero so x hero is this kind of like an idle rpg that has been actually on the market for almost a couple of years already but the success especially in the west uh hasn't been really it's been quite quite low quite low uh, but then what they started to do a bit similarly that they started to kind of like experiment with different kind of a hyper casualist mini game uh, type of uh, ad- advertising uh then they made this probably everybody has seen this save the dog uh, ads <laughs> all around and and then if we look at the performance Uh, that was the kind of like a thing that really exploded the downloads on the game and then like h- how it differs from the like the playrix approach it, it's actually a permanent mode nowadays in the game so you're actually playing this idle rpg character collector rpg that's the main game but then you have these hyper casualist you know mini game save the dog levels then then you play those and then you get some resources in your main game and so on but it's actually a permanent mode so it's a bit you know going a little bit further in terms of like the thinking of like how to do that but it's really really interesting case to kind of like a study like like mentioned if we look at the x hero we saw massive massive re- like a download spike uh, then also the re- revenues followed quite a bit but then if we look at the revenue per download it actually went down because naturally you know probably the conversions of uh, the players that they were able to get those save the dog ads were not were uh, weren't uh, as good as maybe before but if we look at the margins that's probably where they are you know seeing much much more better performance after all uh so that's that's kind of like an interesting kind of like a next step ua driven approach that we see a couple of examples that did that we see these games in china as well currently i think there are at least two two of similar kind of games in the top crossing and it will be interesting to see will we will we see more of this uh, in the west as well but um when um on the topic of uh, mini games of course this is something like everyone has their own definition and opinion on what is what is a mini game you know but um uh anyway i think one sort of genre where there's kind of like a lot of innovation going on when it comes to mini games is actually actually slots so um we are uh currently um at game refinery tracking uh the top uh, slots games uh for a uh, live abstractor tool that will be released uh later in the following months uh and there we can already see that approximately half uh, of the top slots games are actually utilizing some sort of uh, mini games uh in them and just to give you some examples uh we have uh some games having for example bingo mini games word game mini games i already mentioned the merge one which was quite interesting there's this kind of like uh a lottery jackpot thing going on uh, so um that's definitely one way how they are trying to freshen up the the slots uh, gameplay with uh, various kinds of uh, sort of like um side core gameplays uh, to have at least in an event format uh, in this game so so i i would follow that space for uh, exciting innovation in that sense exactly and that's take us to kind of like uh, if we talked about like people doing for the ua purposes and then we have you know the slots genre which is like to be honest the game mini games there still are a bit simpler but it's still probably the main idea is there of course some of them are like purely monetization like disguised in a mini game format but then we we go to kind of like a retention driven thinking and engagement uh, like driven thinking so if we think about the acquiring of the new users is harder than ever uh, again like then you want to keep your players in uh, as well and that is also a kind of like approach that we have seen one good example actually also what playrix has been doing but with their game called township uh, which is a, the tycoon game they have been doing for a long long time but nowadays if you look at their events uh, the core events that they have the most of the events uh, they have and they always have something active are these actually prop what i would call like a proper you know mini game so it's actual gameplay actual you know different you know where is platformer whether it's you know uh, they have added for example match tree uh, mini games into into the township core uh, like on, on top of the like the tycoon core gameplay and, and so on and so on and these type of approaches 
a lot of you know other games like Family Farm Adventure, also a tycoon game, but it's this a bit different approach with the energy based you know exploration uh, type of a game. They have had like merge games. They had a like archery mini game, uh, and then all of these you know events, mini game events are then like intertwined into the whole uh, kind of like a gameplay loop of of your game. So you are getting then benefits. Uh, to your main core gameplay, for example, in Township, you get there are like you get battle bus progression uh, by doing those quests. You get progression for your you know guild war. Uh, you can then you get rewards from for your main core gameplay and so on. So this kind of like a totally different way of thinking about mini games. So actually adding something refreshing uh, for a, for the player, some kind of a new uh, new core gameplay. Also on the mid core side, shooters have been doing it for for a while. Uh, especially Garena Free Fire, they have had this, for example, Stumble Guys, uh, Among Us modes. Just recently, they had this like 1v1 brawler fighting, you know, Mortal Kombat type of a gameplay mode uh, and so on. So especially these, you know, mega games, the very big games, uh, they are adding these kind of like uh, things to just, you know, bring variety to the players, uh, which is interesting. And then as a last example on, on kind of like a, a bit different approach on this one, because all of these have been done kind of like in an event format but then afk arena has been now adding actually permanent like a proper mini game so they had a, like a match three mini game they added just recently survivor.io scaled uh, quite recently uh, like a hit game from habby uh, that kind of like a gameplay that they have but now I, afk arena already added a similar type of a gameplay mode into afk arena uh, which you can then play and then you know yeah, get get variety for the for the play, uh, uh, player in terms of different type of a gameplay. So totally different approach than, for example, you know, Playrix does with their you know create at UA creative mini games or so on. So it's more retention engagement driven approach. But these both approaches we have seen much much more uh, during the past year. Yeah, and because these are in event format, um, well, apart from the stuff that I'm not just just said in the end. Um, like there's, there, there are good ways for developers also to, you know, try out, try out new kinds of things and, 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 you know, because you don't have to, you don't have that kind of fear of it messing up the core, you know, progression and core, core gameplay. You can, you can have it as an event for, let's say seven days. And then if, if, if the metrics are not good enough, for example, just, you know, move on to the next thing. The thing is to be sort of very, very careful with what everyone wants is something to be sort of so synergetic that. The mini gameplay or whatever you're adding into it is is just really uh, already appeals to that market, and then you sort of can yeah maybe bake it in in a more permanent way, and then you sort of have a better product and be very nervous of of ones that exact opposite. Um, and maybe maybe some of the ones where in ninety five percent of people don't care less about it and don't play it, but five, the five percent you really care about, you're almost just sort of using it as an internal funnel to different monetization as well. So um, yeah, that's, that's uh, I mean it, again, it, I think we discussed this in some of the previous podcasts. This sort of game within the game thing then just shows the sort of how some of these games started out very simple, <laughs> sort of mobile games, and now they become these enormous, great sort of gargantuan. I mean, metaverse is the wrong term, but sort of you know, sort of a whole entertainment sort of super apps. I mean, I guess super apps is sort of quite quite interesting sort of concept at the moment but it's all games are becoming that where you can have um yeah all manner of games within a game and if people st- are stuck in it then then keep them in there cool good so um something else we have discussed previously um but, but good to get a sort of a a, a 12 month sort of overview so we're seeing a lot more sort of competitive gameplay in, in in mobile games across all genres so so why do we think that's happening and have we got any good examples what i would uh tie this into is especially in the casual and especially in the uh, puzzle game market, which is a big, big part of the uh, casual market, I would say. So, of course, like competitive, depending on the genre, it's been always part of part of everything. But something that we have seen really increasing uh, in kind of like uh, in games like puzzle games, where the competition naturally hasn't been really a big thing. It's been always, you know, about, you know, just play your own games, you know, complete levels, uh, that's it, and so on. But uh, in the past... Uh, well, it's been going for a while, but I would say it has really exponentially increased in the past year. Uh, are different type of uh, competitive uh, events, competitive features in these type of uh, games as well. And what is really important here to kind of like uh, uh, differentiate from you know direct PvP games and and stuff like that, that most of these ninety nine percent of these basically 
are kind of like an indirect competition. So uh, it's done with the events. So the very classic for uh, like example of this is naturally the like the leaderboard based event that have been used for match three games for a long time. So I don't know, two day, three day event. Uh, when you play your own main progression levels, then you get score for the event and then you're placed in a leaderboard with I don't know, 50 players or so on. And then after the event uh, ends, uh, you might get reward if you uh, played the levels the most. So that's like the very, very like classic traditional uh, example. But this has been like really uh, kind of like uh, expanded on. And especially if you look at, for example, Royal Match, uh, the mega hits uh, of, of the past two years and how they have been scaling their event framework, actually a lot of over half of their events that they are now running, they are basically, if someone is not familiar with Royal Matches, a match three where you just complete levels one by one uh, after, uh, uh, you know, your classic uh, match three game in the gameplay loop. Uh, but how that game has been evolving, what they've been adding since the launch, pretty much everything has been concerning events. And over half of these events that they have added uh, into the event framework actually have been competitive. So different twists to this same idea that, okay, they have added, for example, the lightning rush event, which was this kind of like an event that you player trigger yourself. And then you have one hour, uh, kind of like a leaderboard, um, competition. So that's okay. This is the one hour that I'm going to play. And then when I play, I, of course, just, if you, if I don't want to, I can just play the levels after level after level, just by myself, don't care about it, but there's also that extra competitive push for me that, okay, maybe I'm close to the uh, rewarded positions, then that pushes me to play uh, a little bit more levels. And then naturally that pushes me do the monetization uh, parts of, of your game, which like for the puzzle games, there's nothing really has changed. It's, it's the extra moves, it's the boosters, uh, but it, these kind of like a competitive events gives the extra push for players to play those main progression levels gives the extra incentive because competition it's like uh, for a long time it has been talked about like uh, casual players they don't like competition that or they don't care about it but like when it's implemented in this type of indirect format it's easy to kind of like uh, not care about it it's like if you don't want to compete you can easily uh, you know skip that uh, but this kind of like if player uh, gets that sense of like i really want to get you know, a little bit further, uh, get that uh, rewarded position, uh, it gives me that extra push. And that kind of, uh, you know, variations from different type of race events, I'm just going to go to individual examples, but a lot of, lot of twists around this kind of like a fundamental idea of how to create a, an, an event and how to add a competitive side to it has been really, really, really increasing. Uh, if we look at the kind of like events that different uh, puzzle games have been uh, adding into their uh, like event frameworks. It's interesting that the users sort of choosing to opt into it. So it's sort of, yeah. you might not be interested and then you go, well, I've got, I'm going to be sitting in a queue for a, two hours or something or waiting in an airport or something. So you sort of using it to fill the time that you know you have available. So you're sort of already sort of incentivized to be a bit more competitive maybe. Or... Exactly. And, and I would say like, if you look at those, direct pvp type of uh, features or games in that space they haven't really there there is, is not much examples that have really worked so match masters is probably the only one only game in that space that have really found uh, relatively big success and actually that game has also been scaling uh, in the past uh, few years uh, all the time so kind of like a in that sense there's a uh, ask for the kind of like a competitive nature in these type of a games. But then if we look at outside of that, there really hasn't been much. For example, Candy Crush Soda Saga, they tried to make a, like a more direct PvP feature. Didn't really, pro well, uh, in terms of performance, uh, we didn't see any, you know, big uh, effects and they haven't really, you know, scale it across their portfolio, for example. And this type of like a direct PvP, I totally get that like for this audience, it's not necessarily or like it has to be a specific type of an audience or like there might not be so much overlap but this kind of like a more indirect little bit of extra push utilizing that motivation of competition seems to have really worked because that we have really seen to scale in a big manner uh, in the past year yeah i think the only thing i want to add to this is that I, I think it makes total sense in the in in, in the sense that uh, you you know games get to tap into 
an extended set of motivations and uh, this kind of like competitive and king of the hill motivations. And I think what we're seeing here is the same as what, with, what happened with when casual games started expanding their meta layers and, and through that we're able to tap into new motivations uh, related to those. And I guess like, okay, this is not a puzzle game, but like if we're talking about just, you know, competitive elements getting more popular in, in, in casuals, in casual games in general, I guess stumble guys can be, you know, um, uh, linked to this uh, conversation as well as a, as a very, uh, of course, it's very casualist, it's very party-like, but also very competitive by nature. And, and um, it's also one example of a very competitive driven um casual game i guess we that sort of battle royale is a, is a similar sort of thing where mm. you know i guess a lot of players never get their chicken dinner but they're still quite happy to sort of play you know play within that role so you can you can be very competitive and really force your way through it or you can sort of play in a in a, in a more casual way even though it's a very competitive um game so that's down to the individual cool okay so um renovation and construction um what are we seeing with, with, with those um i guess they've been around for a while yeah um so what we're talking about here is the progression visualization where you know where players have to fix or renovate or decorate or or whatever maybe it's a room maybe it's a mansion maybe it's a garden or a garage or whatever so i guess all of us have been you know been engaging with these types of games uh, and this is obviously nothing new uh but what we are seeing is just just more and more coming up in event format also in games that don't have these this sort of like scape style uh, renovation methods. But to answer the question of like, why are these events uh, so popular, uh, especially in the last, well, in the last year, for example, but if we deconstruct these events, go to the sort of deep end of these, we can see that in the end, they are sort of like task-based events with a progress bar, but just, you know, in renovation events, the progress bar is just, it's just visualized in just a, in a more compelling way. So, you know, cleaning up a house or you renovate a garage, it just feels more satisfying than watching a progress bar grow. So that's definitely one reason, or maybe even the biggest reason why I think we're just seeing more and more of them. So it's just visually engaging way uh, to give players a concrete sense uh, of, uh, of pro uh, progression. And, and one a bit more maybe a specific trend that is related to this is that in certain games, we are also seeing permanent features related to renovation uh, events added. So for example, Lily's Garden has this, maybe Design Home or something like that was the, the name of the feature. But anyway, the idea was that um, you play these recurring events in Lily's Garden and you get uh, these uh, tickets through um, engaging with those events. And then you use those tickets to renovate this permanent feature you have um, in, in the game. And, and similar kind of things, uh, similar thing, thing of feature we uh, I've seen in, for example, Solitaire, Solitaire Cruise as well. So it will be interesting to see if these kinds of uh, permanent features that uh, are renovation um, related that support uh, the recurring uh, event frameworks, will these uh, get more popular in the future as well? So interested to, to see. I know we're saying about, you know, you're going to have an hour, this hour leaderboard, and it's sort of, you're sort of opting into that. So I guess it maybe appeals to a certain type of sort of mindset, people who like to sort of, that sort of completist, get everything t nice and tidy. I mean, I guess you have, to, you have to choose the right psychological sort of cues that you know your audience is going to be sort of interested in. So it probably doesn't play so well in more mid-core games, but yeah, I think you can sort of see it. Yeah, it's nothing new, you know, player escapes games are ancient uh, already almost and been around for a while. But, you know, for example, Toon Blast, you know, which a game that didn't have any type of a meta, uh, just, you know, play level after level, the background picture changes in the menu, and then you just have events and so on. So they started to do this, okay, for the limited time duration, you have almost kind of like a similar view as in Royal Match, you, you have the permanent meta layer, and then, you know, uh, you can... Uh, renovate the castle or whatever in that game. So tapping it through their event for framework, which is interesting. And actually what Callum, what Callum mentioned about this Lily's Garden one is also quite interesting uh, that we have seen in some other games as well. You know, the, the difference here that, you know, it's, you know, Lily's Garden itself, it has this permanent meta layer. It's, it's this kind of like a really gardenscapes type of a game. But like, yeah, they added this another 
renovation that is progressed by playing any of the events in the game. So kind of like a, this feature that ties in all your event frameworks and gives even more extra incentive to participate in the events. And they give this kind of like a connected uh, pr progression vector for all your events. And actually, Royal Match uh, added similar type of a feature as well. So they added this collection. It's not a renovation, but like you collect cards and complete albums and it's a permanent one. It's not limited time, but the way to get those cards is by all the various type of events that the game has. So it gives this extra push for the events. So these type of things that kind of like wrap up the whole event framework together. It's, it's also interesting, interesting one to follow. And the final one we're going to look at is out of app monetization. So what are we talking about there? So I think this was probably discussed also in in, in some previous uh, episode, but it, it would have been it would have felt wrong to to omit it uh, from the list of the top trends we've seen in 2022. So what we're talking about here is the the fact that we are seeing more and more games uh, utilizing out of the uh, app purchase options uh, for players to developers do this obviously to bypass the the Apple. Store fees. So we have seen uh, developers such as Supercell, for example, using external stores. Uh, but um, I think the most interesting example of this has been from Game of uh, Thrones uh, Conquest, which is a horror strategy game. Um, so they, they added a completely new uh, currency. I think it was was called gems. Um, that way, that that is used uh, to buy offers uh, in the game nowadays. Uh, well, you, I, I, I think I, I assume you can still use real money, but it's just as a player, um, you are incentivized to use gems because it's 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 cheaper that way. Um, and it's only sold outside um, the uh, Game of Thrones Conquest, so you can only get it from uh, a specific website or very occasionally uh, in in some of the in-app offers. Uh, uh, in the game but yeah as i said um players get a significantly better deal uh when they buy the gems from the website versus just uh you know buying offers with uh with real money so um this has been something that has been really hot topic in 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 the industry and and and, and we we have seen it in uh implemented uh in some games and and yeah i, I think the game Thrones conquest one has been definitely the most interesting one too I mean, do you think that's that's something that sort of Warner's being a big media company has sort of been been in a stronger position to negotiate those sort of things with Apple as a sort of a, a, a sort of you know a separate sort of thing, or is it you know is this something that over time will become available to everyone? Because sort of clearly, everyone the more of their revenue they can get out of the App Store, thirty percent, then the, <laughs> that's just what they're going to want to do, isn't it? So it's sort of interesting because it seems like how is how are people being allowed to do it now? Um, within the terms and conditions of an app store and it's, it's, it seems very um, opaque. Yeah, I guess it's of course comes back down to the Epic uh, Epic Apple uh, lawsuit case and what was the verdict of that. So basically you can have these uh, outside uh, app monetization stores, but the funny thing is that you cannot really advertise inside app that's not allowed by Apple. So actually, that's why I think, uh, like Kala mentioned, the, the Game of Thrones example is quite interesting one because you have the currency in the store uh, in the inside the game and then and when you know go and try to find out like where actually i can get this it's just like find out more somewhere else you know in their website and so on. so it's kind of like this playing around with the kind of like a rules quite there close to kind of like is it allowed or is it not allowed but it's still part of the game so but yeah uh, definitely like uh, it's increasing more and more and you know uh, there are companies that are helping uh, different developers to do this uh, uh, type of a thing. So uh, more and more this type of a store. So of course we see it first in in the big big companies doing it, uh, like Supercells and so on, which are have the resources to make their own web web stores and so on. But like constantly, especially looking at the top crossing too, which is naturally most of the big companies uh, or mostly big companies. So. Uh, we are seeing it increasing more and more. For example, actually, I think Brawl Stars, look, Supercell added this one for Brawl Stars just last week, I think so. So now they have like Class of Clans, Heyday and Brawl Stars and have this possibility to kind of like get better deals if you go there to their web, web store and web shop to buy, uh, buy the deals compared to kind of like buying it actually in app. But then, of course, especially for the casual genres, I think it's more... Um, more harder, you know, mid-core, hardcore players, they will find the way, they will, you know, figure this out. But like for casual player who just plays 
casualism match free players, how you get them guided into your apps outside of the app web store, much more, much more difficult. And actually, we have a list of these games uh, among the top games that are utilizing it. And actually, Yatsi with buddies, uh, Scopely, um, from Scopely, it's the only casual game. Uh, well, well, Heyday, of course, is a casual game as well from Supercell, but those are the two only casual games and all the other are basically mid-core, mainly these really hardcore, mid-core type of a titles like strategy and RPG type of a games and so on. So. Uh, definitely a more trend over there, not so much in, in the casual, but then these big companies that have a really wide portfolio and have this kind of like infrastructure ready already, like Scopely, they have pretty much a store for all of their games nowadays. Uh, so Yatsi is kind of like a, there as well. Uh, but yeah, definitely, like like Kalle said, uh, if we look back at bigger trends of last, last year, it has to be kind of like I mentioned. Not yet super widely used, but it's it's all the time increasing uh, over the past past year. I'm 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 100 sure that in the next year we're gonna see it even more. For someone playing a casual game and occasionally spending five dollars like once every couple of months, the friction of going to a website and putting in credit cards doesn't really matter. Whereas if you're someone who spends a thousand dollars a month in a hardcore game, then clearly the 30 percent is gonna be is gonna be sort of worth worth your while doing that. Cool. Well, we've covered uh, quite a lot of stuff there. Um, thank you very much uh, to Erno and uh, Kale for their expertise. Also, uh, we've been looking, looking back in 2020. Uh, in this podcast, we will be uh, looking forward into what's going to happen in uh, 2023. So the uh, time time never stops on the uh, Mobile Game Dev podcast. So, so uh, don't forget to subscribe uh, to the channel through your podcast uh, channel or subscription service of choice. And uh, also, if you're watching on, uh, on on video as well, please subscribe. Uh, every episode, we're looking at the uh, mobile game space, which is still, uh, as we always say, the the biggest the biggest single sector in 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 the gaming uh, universe and uh, growing fast globally. So, uh, hopefully, we are providing these insights that will uh, keep you informed and uh, come back next time to see what's going on. Well, next time we'll be talking about 2023. So, so that's a, a really good one to uh, tune in for. Till next time, see you then.